Welcome back to Through the Ringer. I'm your host, Tate Frazier. We got a very fun show ahead. We got Nora Princiati joining us later to talk some NFL headlines. But first and foremost, we got to get to Cousin Sal. Sal, good to see you, man. Too good long. Good to see you, pal. I know. Why do we do this all just once a week? I know. We really should load it up like seven seven times, I'd say, would be enough. Seven I think podcasts. seven times every single day we do this yeah. show and we talk about the biggest headlines. That would be the best way to do this. Hopefully, we can get there at some day. We're going to have a very fun show. Like I said, we're going to get to my favorite game. But first, First, we got to get to first Tate, and uh, we got a Germany game this week, Sal. It made you okay. wake up even earlier. Actually, you're already up because you're doing the pregame show, obviously. But uh, we got mm-hmm. to watch my Carolina Panthers get the win. So the first Tate I say to you, Sal, I'm officially giving Bryce Young the Bronny James treatment. Um, this is what Bronny James has showed us. You know what I mean? You can kind of cradle someone a little bit, uh, a future superstar. You can just kind of give them the little wins, the little victories. You can cheer them on. Bryce Young deserves this. I mean, there's been a lot of haters, myself included, but getting this win in victory formation, I decided this weekend I am going to celebrate the little wins because we don't know how many we're going to get, Sal. And uh, this is something that we got to do moving forward with Bryce Young. How do you feel oh about God, that? Oh, my God. What a dismal outlook that is. I, I have to say, I was excited to do this show today like I now said you're losing beginning. now i don't now i don't even know what you're talking about we're giving him the brawny tr- so treatment Eagle- I like, celebrate the little things you know what i mean that's all it is right so if he's one for eight for two points you're good like we're all right if they get the win if they get the win if they get the win i'm all for it football is a crazy <laughs> sport takes its toll mentally and physically and if he wants to vibe out in the locker room afterwards after win against the pitiful giants on foreign soil Go get him, Bryce. I like it. I like that he's making a comeback. I like when you prove the doubters wrong, and uh, Bronny's doing that with the South Bay Lakers. We got Bryce doing that with the Carolina Panthers. Next up, Sal, first Tate. Beast Herbert uh, is not a good nickname. If you didn't see this, Jim Harbaugh is now calling Justin Herbert, quarterback of the Chargers, Beast Herbert. He's half man. He's half beast. Now, Justin Herbert's playing some really good football, Sal. I'm enjoying mm-hmm. him, watching him play football. He's doing some great things. Had a great QB sneak this week for a touchdown. But I think Harbaugh's nickname is a little bit off. Um, so I'm not really feeling the nickname. I am feeling the play. I am feeling the relationship between Harbaugh. He's in love with Justin Herbert. But Beast Herbert doesn't feel quite right. Uh, your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I'm with you. I think it's lazy. Coaches are good at certain <laughs> things, right? Scheming. Okay. Scheming nicknames, not good for Harbaugh. I think he should pass this off to a coordinator. Beast Herbert doesn't work. But Herbert does need to be changed. It's not a fierce competitive name i know it's not his first name but like herbert hoover would still be president had mm. he changed his name but it's not the case i think like hercules herbert is good Ooh. or or hulk herbert hulk uh, herbert uh, you know hogan could pass the torch here it's, you got it, hulk herbert it's at least alliteration touchdown. it's at least something it's moving in the right yeah. direction so i i do like Thank the you. idea of a beast uh hulk is sounds like the perfect middle ground here so hulk herbert we're gonna go for that uh last one last first date the Bears drafted the wrong Carolina quarterback, Sal. I say that to you. Mitch Trubisky <laughs> famously drafted by the Bears. They traded up for him. They got killed because Pat Mahomes was in that same draft. Mitch Trubisky obviously won the MVP, uh, but he moved on and uncere- er- unceremoniously. Now we're two quarterbacks later. This draft, Drake May was right there. They could have traded the number one pick, maybe got the third pick, got some more assets, built around Drake May, and they watched him this weekend get the win in Chicago. So I, I, I just right logic, wrong pick. Pick, wrong time, Sal. That's wow. what I'm saying. Wow. I uh, I am saying, please, please pump the Beantown brakes here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know you have to root for him. He's a Carolina yeah. guy, and Simmons and the Patriots fans, and nephew Kyle have to root for him because he's a Pats fan. But do we have to send him to Canton right away? Yes. Like, let's think about Mac Jones. We do because <laughs> Mac Jones threw seven games at nine touchdowns and a 95 RTG. So. And where is he? Now he's a punchline for the uh, wherever, Jacksonville, who's going to win like three and a half games or something. So let's slow down a little. But I get it. I get the enthusiasm. Yeah, this weekend I had to watch Mac Jones on one screen, uh, Drake May on the other screen with Bill Simmons and Kyle, and uh, both of them saying, look how far we've come. We've gone from Mac Jones uh, (laughs) with the Jaguars to Drake May. It was a beautiful moment in time. They love Mac Jones. Everybody loves Mac Jones. Not anymore. Yeah, well, maybe they still have a soft spot for him, but who knows? (laughs) Uh, I got a soft spot for this. This is my favorite game, and let's play it over under reactions. I read you a statement sound. You tell me if it's an over under reaction or sometimes even a proper reaction. Mm-hmm. Let's start with Dakota Prescott, aka Dak Prescott. I say to you, Sal, Dak is the luckiest Dallas Cowboy out for the season, reported by Jerry Jones. Over or under reaction. What say you? I wanted to say something like, you know, I was going to be like, give you a snide remark here, but <laughs> it, this is an underreaction. He's absolutely, as I look through the roster, he's actually, he's the 
absolute luckiest man. Maybe Deuce Vaughn, the running back who doesn't play at all, but is still seen as a college football uh, phenom running back. So, but you no, know, Dak Prescott's making $60 million. He's going to sit back and get surgery, and then he's going to play his PS5 for seven months and not have to be part of the stink, and he doesn't even have to get blinded by that light coming through the stadium. Of course, Dak Prescott is the luckiest on this team. Yeah, and Trey the, Lance. Unluckiest, anyone roots for them. Yeah, Trey Lance, you especially, yes. Sal. Trey Lance was the luckiest, but he had to play this week and expose himself, so then he <laughs> got knocked yeah. off the list, and then Dak bumped himself right into He should have refused to come in. That was terrible what they did to Trey Lance, making him uh, show his face on that field. Well, and the saddest part is a lot of times when things are going bad, you say the sun will come out tomorrow, but you don't want the sun to come out in Dallas. They do not want that uh, sun look around. At you. And, here uh, here you we know. go. You and your show tunes again. We can never <laughs> slow you down. My God. Yeah, just keep rolling. Uh, let's talk about Patrick Mahomes, Sal. Patrick Mahomes is the most unbeatable athlete of his generation over or under reaction. He seems like the guy can't lose. I, I think you're right. I was going to say Roman Reigns or someone like that, maybe the most unbeatable athlete of our generation. You know, our dear brain dead Har friend Harry um, <laughs> claims that the referees are on his side, which makes him virtually unbeatable, this Patrick Mahomes character. And he went as far as to say the block kick was orchestrated by Roger Goodell. Now, yes, from the top down. Yes, and he was also, <laughs> within hours of that statement, was texting you about the North Florida Osprey. So mm -hmm. I, we have to do something. I think if enough people, I don't even, I think we're past intervention part here. We have to have him committed in some capacity. Just ignore him, though, right? Because uh, I have to showcase right. Harry. You don't have to. So please don't encourage him. I think Mahomes is the most unbeatable athlete. Yeah, the Ospreys are unbeatable right now, too, in college basketball. <laughs> Give them a shout-out as well. But Harry, okay. yes, uh, I like the way that you described him. Uh, he, he's a beautiful... His heart is a lot bigger than his brain, as we like to say. I didn't say, say beautiful. I didn't say beautiful <laughs> once. Let's keep it going. <laughs> Despite the drama, the 49ers are NFC favorites with Christian McCaffrey back on the field over or under reaction, Sal. Do you like the Niners? Um... I do like them. I like them for the division. I don't think they're the top of the class in the NFC. I think we learned a lot from the Lions. So I'm going to say overreaction here. In the last two weeks, we saw the Lions can win in all elements. They went to Green Bay and won a tough game. And then they won this game. They had no business winning Monday night against the Texans. And we also learned about C.J. Stroud. He can't hit a simple pass to tank. That's something you definitely would have. He was wide open for 30 yards or so. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's beside the point. They win. They win the, I, I think Detroit is the one seed and that's going to be a very tough place to go to win two to one to win the conference, I think actually has a little bit of value. Yeah. And CJ Stroud, the second half, uh, there's something there <laughs> with what he's been able to, you know, do in the first half versus the second half. There's some sort of tell that's going on. They'll figure it out. Let's talk about the dolphins. Uh, Sal, the dolphins saved the state of Florida from the worst week in football history. Went one and nine as a state, uh, overall college uh -huh. and the NFL over or under reaction. I'm going to say it's an overreaction because the state of Florida cannot be saved. It's been proven that. I um, mean, every week there's like three stories about like a peanut farmer who's sunbathing in the nude and gets eaten by an alligator. So how are you going to save a state like that? No, it's unbelievable. One in nine. And this only happens because Florida State and Florida are, are not good anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Like we had to wait decades for that to happen for them to get to one and nine. But the Dolphins did save them. Mike McDaniel should remember this when it's time, right, to renegotiate the coach. He's like, hey, I saved Florida, Ron DeSanctimonious. What are you going to do? I need a little bit of a bonus here. And luckily they have North Florida, uh, the Ospreys. Oh, right. uh, they the saved Ospreys. them on the basketball side of things, not the, the football Ospreys side. The Ospreys saved Florida. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. Let's, that's, let's admit it. That's yeah. what everyone's saying. Uh, <laughs> Sal, Saints interim coach Darren Rizzi is the most relatable coach in the NFL. Told a whole story about clocking a toilet uh, before it. the game and then uh, ends up getting a win in his first interim game. Bill Simmons, very upset he did not bet the Saints. Uh, he believed in the kind of new regime bounce back game. Decided, got talked out of it by Joe House, apparently. I don't know about the intricacies yeah. there, but... Uh, he was very upset he didn't bet this game, and the Saints are very happy that they finally got a win. Over or under reaction, what say you? Well, Simmons redeemed himself because he came up with the nickname the Clogger. And really, like any time when, when that came out, when he clogged the toilet in the morning, the Saints went from plus three and a half to minus seven. Mm. I mean, that is a that's a swing for sure. Like John Madden used to clog the toilet six times a day, and that's why he had so many championships with the Raiders. But I, I think it's spectacular that he admitted this. Now, here's what's interesting. They're playing the Browns this week, New Orleans. The Browns seems to be Rizzi's 
kryptonite. If you want to read between the lines here, the Browns, yeah. either way, you're betting on the Browns, you're going to win. <laughs> I don't want to get blue here with yeah. the Browns. Yeah, don't uh, get too it. blue, but uh, okay. yeah, the, the, Brown will be the, con- the Browns will be the conversation this weekend. Yes. Uh, next up, Sal Steel City Special is the surest bet in sports in case you haven't kept up. Sal, it's uh, the Steelers, they lose the first half, they win the game. You've been hammering this for over a year at this point, and it hits yeah. again this weekend over or under reaction. I feel like I sh- we shouldn't brag too much about Sal Steel City Special because it could bankrupt our friends at FanDuel Sportsbook. That's true. In fact, right. they might have just cut all this out. This could just be a <laughs> test pattern running because they don't want to lose money off of this. Yeah, mm-hmm. just like you said, Steelers opponent first half, Steelers to win the game, plus 800 last week. It's hit three times this year. It hit four times, I believe, last year. Something about Mike Tomlin not being able to get the team ready until the second half, and that's when they pour on the points and win the game. It's already up 17 units this year, Tate. Uh, it's going to happen again. Just be patient and make the same bet over and over. I get fired up whenever you start talking units, Sal. So uh, I you. love that. I 17 units. Love to see that. Uh, <laughs> we might need 17 teams for the college football playoff, Sal. And I say oh. to you, 12 teams may not be enough for this year's college football playoff. Too many good teams over or under reaction. You know, I think it's an underreaction, and I was screaming about, no, we don't have to go from four to 12. Let's just try six. We could have two buys, and then the mm-hmm. four teams play each other, and then we'll have a semifinal, and then they move it to 12, and I find myself, like yesterday, spending an hour and a half figuring out how to get SMU, how to keep SMU in and also add old Miss. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm a grown man. I don't need to do this. <laughs> they'll figure it out in the next three weeks. They'll knock each other off, but there you go. Uh, I will say this. Get ready for a one-loss Big Ten team to get nudged out by a two-loss SEC team, at least. It might be even more than that. Yeah, I hope it's not Indiana. I'm a big fan of Signetti. So uh, if they're the team that is uh, on the wrong side of the playoff, I feel like there's going to be a lot of people, kind of the underdogs of college football, that are going to be upset about that. So it's a conversation I point. I think it's Penn State or Indiana. It, yeah. it all depends really how Indiana plays against Ohio State, not this week, but next. Well, if it's between those two, I think we kick Penn State out just yeah, because we've fine. seen them uh, in all the big games and it doesn't yeah. go so well. So that's, uh, yeah, yeah, let's do that. They live college in Happy Valley. Valley. They play in Happy Valley. <laughs> yeah, they'll be fine. They'll be happy. happy. They'll be happy. Uh, next up, South Oklahoma City, the Thunder will win over one and a half NBA titles in the next five seasons. Chet Holmgren just went out with an injury. He's going to yeah. be out for uh, quite a while right now, but they still have a very good team. Best defense in the NBA and obviously a lot of young talent over under reaction. Do you see titles in the future for the Thunder? SGA putting up in the 40s some games, just mm-hmm. running away with it. I'm going to say overreaction, though. I think over one and a half. So two in the next five years is a lot. It really is. Uh, they could have the best regular season record in the next five years and still not win the title, right? You got Boston on the east, if they get that far, still going to be good for years. And then on the west, they'd have to get through Denver, Dallas, the Suns, Rockets, two out of five years. I don't think so. I would go under. What do you think? I think they could make the finals twice. I just don't see them winning uh, two titles. Uh, Maybe they win one of those when they get there. But uh, like Mm -hmm. you said, it's hard to win two titles in five years, especially with all the parity in the NBA I can't do it. Yeah, no, I know. You're Come right. on, we're all trying to figure it out. And the reason why they might not be able to do it is because of this guy, Sal. Milwaukee Bucks, they will trade Giannis Antetokounmpo by this year's <laughs> trade deadline. Obviously, BS was putting out some trade possibilities. The Brooklyn Nets on the tip of his tongue. But over or under reaction, you think the trade is in the future for Giannis? Listen, Simmons held me hostage with this rant uh, for about 15 minutes. And yeah, now you're going to give me 20 minutes. Let me seconds. go off on this. Yeah, I was I, waiting for you to throw out some second apron takes. Uh, oh, I didn't hear too my many. God, second apron. I was going to choke myself on an apron. <laughs> the first one I found. Uh, the, yeah, they would get Portland second rounder in 2025. They get the Grizzlies first in 2038. They get the Supersonic right. protected pick in 1994. <laughs> like I had that enough. But uh, now it's off the board. To his credit, you can't bet the Nets to make the playoffs. Because right. he drove the number all the way down for something that's probably not going to happen because Giannis has to agree to go to Brooklyn. That's the main thing he forgot. doesn't matter how many picks they have. He's not going to give a crap about how many picks are coming Milwaukee's way. And I actually think he stays, even though his best years in Milwaukee are probably behind him. I don't think they get rid of him at the deadline. What do you think? I, I don't think so either. And I do feel like the Bucks are, you know, basically all the way in at this point. And Chris Middleton is really the answer. They really will know where they stand when Middleton comes back. If he can come back, they need that third score. Giannis and Dame are playing great. They just need that third guy. Bobby Portis, by the way, has been uh, putrid to say the least. So they got to figure that out. But uh, I don't think a trade happens. Last thing, Sal, tortillas are the least offensive food that can be thrown at you. Obviously, tomatoes is the old trope here. Uh, going back mm. to the show tunes era. Um, but yeah, Texas Tech fans, they throw tortillas over under 
to reaction. Uh, your thoughts on being being uh, you know kind of the recipient of a tortilla hitting you in the face? Yes. Well, you know, I think it depends. I'm not going to answer this, and I know if, until <laughs> I know is it corn or flour tortillas? Because corn mm. are made from whole grains with fewer calories. Flour is just going to make you fat, and which is uh, embarrassing, you know, and ex expanding <laughs> your stomach. But I I'm jealous. I wish someone would throw food at me. The only right. thing I'll like the, the kids will throw grapes, and we'll try to catch them in our mouths, and it's stupid. We get tired of it for after 20 seconds. But I've never had th food thrown at me. I would even start with a, a Nacho Bel Grande Supreme. Let's do it. Yeah. And now what's funny though, Tate, was that these tortillas, Shador Sanders signed one of them because there were too many being thrown at him. So he actually signed one. And that one's worth like more than the house your parents grew up in. Yeah. The shout out to yeah. Shador Sanders. Very smart of him to, to make some marketing off of this. And obviously, you know, I think Taco Bell should get in the mix. You know, maybe you can actually throw some Taco Bell food out there for the people. Right. You know, some tortillas. I don't know. Something like fun it. there. I like it. You're um, always thinking marketing, Tate. Wow. <laughs> That's, maybe that's what I need to do. Uh, let's call up the captain. Let's do some prop culture because it is a fun one this week, Sal. We're all talking about the New York Jets, so the captain is asking the question, what's the funniest New York Jets moment from the past 25 years? And boy, do we have a lot to pick from. Let's mm. start with the favorite. Of course, you know it. You remember it. The butt fumble, minus 250. Sam Darnold seeing ghosts, 5-1. to one. The Aaron Rodgers era in general, 10-1. to one. Bill Belichick quitting after one day, and he wrote a note to let him know. People forget about this. Bill, yes. Bill Belichick wrote a handwritten note to say he was going to resign and then was out of the building. An incredible thing. 20 to 1 odds. And then we got the field at even odds. What say you, Sal? What's the funniest moment for the Jets? These are such good choices. Bill Belichick, there's still rumors that his dog wrote that letter, too. So I don't know. The ghosts are <laughs> I think great. Lombardi wrote fumble. it for him. Lombardi, Lombardi said, we got to get out of here. Lombardi. Yeah, the butt <laughs> fumble. It's so good. You know what? I'm going to say Aaron Rodgers because it's pretty damn funny now, right? He gets hurt after carrying the flag out. Great American falls flat on his face like three plays later. Uh, blows off a chunk of the preseason to go on some ayahuasca retreat. Brings in all his buddies. None of them can catch anymore. The Jets are <laughs> terrible. But I think it's unwritten. The end is unwritten. And that's where it's going to be funniest. He's going to be part of a you know, a team that's like four and 10 is like, I got to get out of here. He's going to make up some conspiracy theory that uh, New York pizza creates brain worms or stuff. Or yeah. that there are Al Albanians living in the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree or something. And then everybody's going to be like, all right, time out. We got to get rid of this lunatic. So I look forward to that. I like the odds at 10 to 1, and I do feel like it is that moment where it's like, you know, when people say this is the worst day ever, it's the worst day yet. And I do feel like there are Ooh. worse days ahead, you know, for the New York Jets and the Aaron Rodgers era. So I like that at 10 to 1. I'm going to go with Tim Tebow uh, when he joined the team. I just remember those pictures in the rain when he was like out there by himself, like basically throwing the football to himself, and he was going to go there and be the savior uh, for the New York Jets at the time. And uh, that was just a hilarious That's how experience. pathetic they are. I completely forgot about that. You're right. That was pretty <laughs> Tim, bad, too. Tim Tebow. Yeah. in the rain, throwing the football to himself, yeah. saying, I will be the savior of the New York Jets. He was the original uh, 2.0 of Broadway Joe. People forget this. So That's true. Uh, what yep. a time. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to do some line look aheads and track to the futures with Cousins House. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Through the ringer, we're here with Cousin Sal, and we're having a lot of fun talking all types of topics. We already played my favorite game, and now we got to look mm -hmm. ahead to the week ahead in the NFL. We're going to start with Thursday Night Football. Line look ahead here. We got the Commanders taking on the Eagles. NFC East Showdown. Eagles minus three and a half in this game. The total is 48 and a half. Sal. How fired up for you are you for this uh, NFC East showdown? I know these are two uh, teams that are, you know, obviously the enemy, but it uh, should be yeah. a fun game. Yeah, so like zero. Can I say zero? <laughs> yeah, that's know. good. No, that's it's good a good answer. game. I like when Al gets a good game. You got a good one in Baltimore, Cincinnati. He has a nice one here. Uh, he has the Steelers coming up, I think, in a couple weeks or something. Mm -hmm. So this is decent. Um, I picked this line exactly on Guess the Lines um, Sunday night with Simmons, which I think uh, earns me the right to get a free – free spin on his yacht whenever I want, right. which is good. Um, but I will say it's tough because I want to say the Eagles will take complete control of this division with a win, but we saw them lose five out of six towards the end. So they could collapse. They have that in them for sure. But either way, I'm going to say minus 240 for them to win the division. 
is a good number here. I expect the Eagles to take care of business there. They've yeah. got also, if you want a, a total here, they've gone over in seven of the last nine home games. I like the over. I like them at home. I do feel like there is a little bit of tinge of like the commanders losing to the Steelers. Maybe there is a bounce back factor uh, yep. with this team where there's the emotional hangover of that loss. They come out in a short week and get a big win. So something to keep an eye on. But you also like a player prop in this one, Sal. Saquon, right? That's what, you, that's what you're going with? I do. Saquon Barkley over, it was 12 and a half, went to 13 and a half receiving yards minus 114 he's done this in six of the last seven games at home he averages 25 a game over that stretch they work him into that offense however they can right Jalen Hurts uh Barkley averages three targets per game which should put him over the 12 and a half if he catch two of them on the commie side Jalen Warren went for 29 yards receiving the Steelers running back so this is doable I could see them losing him out there uh lose track of the tailback jumping out on the bubble screen. Let's go Saquon over 13 and a half receiving yards. Yeah, I see it. The Saquon safety valve, uh, you mm -hmm. know, you're open here. Just give me 12 yards, and maybe that happens a couple times in this game. So I like that at the odds, minus 114. I'm going to go with first scoring play, Eagles field goal. I just, if I close my eyes and I look ahead at this game, I feel like it's a boring <laughs> drive, and, you know, you, you feel like it's a chance, maybe one big play, you know, to get him down into the red zone, and then, you know, it all kind of stalls out, and they kick a field goal. So I see that Sirianni for three. That is pretty damn specific. Yeah. That's good. They're going to get the ball, and then they're going to yeah. go down and kick a field goal kick a field goal how many yards in. how long is it going to be i think the field goal is going to be about 47 yards uh okay. you know what i mean and it's after a sack they they had a nice chip shot uh but it was a big oh. sack trying to get a big play and you know they're going to kick i the feel like you've yarder. seen this game you have too much information <laughs> on this frazier oh, i already right. watched it yeah it's going to be a good one so <laughs> thursday night football tune in uh herb street al michaels the tie is looking good he's locked in he can see november football on the way so it's good times let's track to the future here sal let's talk about the arizona cardinals first place right now in the NFC West, and uh, we got some odds here. Arizona Cardinals to make the playoffs, yes, is minus 132, but you don't necessarily believe in Arizona right now, Sal, right? Oh, no, I think it's going to be close, and I think they've been doing a good job. Kyler Murray's at a record for completion, right? Consecutive completions. Mm -hmm. Their defense is playing well. They're beating up on teams at the you know, coin flip game, so they're doing everything right. I'm thinking, though, they're going to have to win this division. I think this Arizona team is out. I had high hopes for the West, but I, I don't see it. I don't think they're going to do it. It's going to be close. Nine and a half wins is also interesting if you want to take the under or over for Arizona. But I think San Francisco wins a the division. There's no Let's talk college football. There oh. is uh, something that, Sal, you've been on fire, but the last two weeks it has soured no because I've talked about it too much. This is the problem. You start no, putting things out in the ether. I'll take the blame, Sal. It's my fault. But we got... It's not you. It's me. No, yeah. it's me. I'm going to take it. Uh, <laughs> college football upset specials. Who do you like this week, Sal? We each pick an upset. Yeah, North Texas was my upset last week. They played like a team called North Texas, what you'd expect them to play. This week I like UCLA <laughs> over Washington. Very underrated Ooh. team. These Bruins, I know I'm picking them to win, but their spread record is 6-2-1. and one. They're feisty. They've won three in a row. And listen to these losses. Indiana, LSU, Penn State, and Oregon. Three of those teams are probably making the playoffs. Deshaun Foster's really turned them around. Uh, I think Tamarian Harden goes for over 100 yards rushing. UCLA wins this uh, former Pac-12 rivalry. Everyone's getting me back on track. I like it. And everyone kind of jumped off the ship with UCLA when they got blown out by Indiana. And now, in retrospect, everybody's getting, there's a lot of people getting blown out by Indiana. Indiana's a really good team. Yeah. It just looked really bad early in the season. And now, you know, in retrospect, right. looks pretty good. So I think what you're do right. you like? I like Deshaun Foster as a head coach, but I also like Navy <laughs> over Tulane. Uh, right. Last week, uh, Army took the you know the bad side of things, so I decided to salute in honor of Veterans Day. Uh, yeah. You know, my grandpa was in the Navy, so a little shout out to him. I'm gonna take Navy over Tulane uh, plus one ninety eight, <laughs> Sal, uh, and hopefully I can be right for once. I've tried to do the the opposite here, where this is not actually what I think is gonna happen. I'm trying to course correct, where it's like my gut right. has been incorrect uh, for the it feels like forever with these college football football upset special so this week i'm gonna go with navy and i think they get it done and uh, hopefully i'll be right for once i was right the first week but haven't been right since well respect to your um you know your ancestors but my grandfather <laughs> fought in the battle of tulane in 1876 mm. so i feel like i gotta take tulane here yeah. but whatever it's fine we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we can talk about it yeah we'll, we'll get into the minutia of that let's track to the future let's talk about the big 10 uh because there are a lot of people that are trying to figure out who's going to win the big 10 and uh, that is the big question so if you look at the odds ohio state and oregon both at plus 105 indiana plus a thousand who do you like to win the big 10 this year 
All right, I'm going to kick Indiana to the side, and I'll tell you why in a second. So before the, and I'm from an Oregon family, right? My kid goes mm-hmm. there to Eugene. But before the year, I said Ohio State wins this conference. I'm going to stick to it. I said that Oregon would win when the game was up in Eugene against Ohio State. And then, then when they rematched for the conference championship in Indianapolis or wherever the hell it is, it's going to be Ohio State prevailing. Now, here's what they have to do. Uh, Northwestern, they have to beat. They have to beat. Indiana, which is kind of tough, but they're home. And then Michigan, which should be a walk in the park. I can't believe I'm saying that in this day and age. But Ryan Day's team's back on track. Fairly convincing win against Penn State. And then they mauled Purdue. So uh, my son's going to hate it. But this could also be good for Oregon, right? Mm -hmm. They could get that coveted five seed, play Boise State, who they already beat. And, uh, you know, they'd be playing them at home December 20th. So I don't think this is a bad spot for either, but if I had to, I would take Ohio State plus the 105. And I think if you're Dan Lanning, uh, you'll take the better matchup in the playoff to actually make a run to go win the national championship. So uh, at the end of the day, it might work out uh, in your favor if you're an Oregon Ducks fan and they beat Boise State already this year. So I like that. Um, I'm just going to go with Indiana for the value of it all, plus a 1,000. Hmm. I just, uh, Signetti has won me over with all this kind of old school mantras. They typically never work, but somehow work with him. So, uh, you know, I'll take Indiana there. Now let's flip the script. Let's talk about uh, UFC line look ahead. UFC 309 mm. style. We got John Jones versus Miacic here. And John Jones is the heavy favorite. Both these guys have not fought in quite some time. So how are you handicapping this and what's the play here? Yeah, Jones, it's been over a year and a half since Jones fought, right? He destroyed mm-hmm. Cyril Gaon, uh in the first round submission. And we keep looking for reasons to doubt him. And a lot of it's like he's old and has too much rust. Well, Stipe hasn't fought in three years. He's 42. <laughs> Jones is like 37, 38. So Jones has the rust advantage. But I think he's going to, this is a dangerous, dangerous bet because you don't want to really bet unders in Jones fights. Um and I'm not going to. I'm going to go over a round and a half at minus 156. I think he's going to, because he's had the layoff, he's going to want to get some work in here. And eventually he's going to take Stipe out like the second or third round. Yeah, third so round. Th- there you have it. Uh, I trust you there. I'm not a UFC connoisseur you by any sorts. You should watch this one uh, but Go I over will. Simmons' house and watch this. I'm uh, inviting you over there. I'm not even going to be there, but you should go there. <laughs> I'm going to go over there, knock on the door and say, please put on UFC 309 and uh, <laughs> we'll right. tune in. Let's talk about Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson. Uh, something that probably will be on Bill Simmons' television this weekend. Uh, mm-hmm. Paul is minus 215 in this one. Tyson plus 172. Uh, best bets for this one and just your general thoughts because this is uh, quite a moment in time for boxing. My general thought is everyone's going nuts betting Tyson here. He was plus 250 like four days ago and now Mm -hmm. he's plus 172. People like the underdog. People like the story. I think there are two results here, Tate. I think Tyson by knockout plus 240, which is what everybody's taking, so it's probably not going to happen, or Paul by decision plus 300, and Mm. then they can market him further, right? Because Tyson's just going to be happy to get out of there. I think that's probably the result. I'll bet Tyson because it's fun, but um, and they have the heavy gloves, the 14 ounces, so Tyson might be a little less likely to knock him out there, and then once Paul feels like he can take his power, he's just going to jab at him. But I'm actually looking more forward to Mark Rober against Larry Holmes on the undercard in the uh, YouTuber, former great boxer, series challenge here (laughs) yeah i can't wait for the under there uh yeah this is fascinating to watch and i do feel like mike tyson uh the lead up to this he said that they've uh, awakened kind of the old version of mike tyson he doesn't know how to put iron mike back into the box uh all the lead up has gotten me to believe in mike tyson which lends itself to probably what you said jake paul decision gets this and (laughs) you know they're gonna market him moving forward he knocked out iron mike so it's uh, the classic thing last thing sal the tate debate i was watching the patriots this weekend and i watched the nine sacks by their defensive line and i watched their defensive line help caleb williams up multiple times in this game and it led me to the tape debate and i asked you this question and we can talk about this is it okay to help up the other team's player um or is this kind of an indictment on the team that lets the other team help up their actual player because if i'm the old lineman for the bears no chance am i letting these d linemen for the patriots help up my quarterback but we saw it happen multiple times and i do feel like this is something that's kind of an unwritten rule that you shouldn't let happen uh, especially if you're an offensive lineman but your thoughts on this when you saw it this weekend 
I am 100% with you. I think the O-linemen should be helping their own player up. The problem is they're sitting on their asses, too, from being knocked backwards. <laughs> That's so true. Everybody Everybody's being the, the coaching staff needs to help the players up. So, And if I'm a team like the Patriots helping Caleb Williams, I keep doing this over and over, right? Mm-hmm. This is this is a better flex than like a sack dance would would provide, right? And then you got you got a highlight reel, reel of this happening over and over and over nine times guys picking up your quarterback what could be more embarrassing than that so i'm all for it if you're the patriots and shame on the bears for letting it happen yeah and shout out to the patriots d-line killing him with kindness uh very uh-huh. genius and it almost felt like at a certain point caleb williams was almost okay to get sacked you know what i mean because he's like i get to talk to my buddies get a little high five get a little help up you know what i mean yeah. it's gonna be a nice be moment, one so. with the earth yeah exactly <laughs> yeah he's grounding uh very smart of <laughs> caleb williams he did a lot of that this past weekend so you're the best where can we find all your work and then we'll let you go enjoy the rest of your day Thanks, buddy. Against all odds, twice a week on Ringer Podcast. I have our cousin Sal's winning week. I'm having Roy Jones Jr. on oh, to yeah. talk about this Tyson Paul fight and then the Ringer pregame show on Sunday. And then guess the lines with Simmons. Uh, he's going to go over trade possibilities for Wemby for all 29 teams uh, out there. Oh, it's going to be, be great. Uh, Roy, jo- <laughs> Roy jo- Jones Jr., uh, my guy can't be touched. Uh, I'm excited to, to watch right. that interview. Cousin Sal's winning week and go check that out. We'll be right back on the other side of the break. We got the Ringer's very own Nora Princiati joining us. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. Joining us now, she's back on the show. It is the great Nora Princiati. Nora, good to see you. How are you? Hi, Tay. Good. How are you? Good. We have a lot to get to. Uh, it is not going to be about pop music. We got to talk about footballs. I know it, it hurts. Tough, I wish we uh, could. We we should do that. For me. Come on, Grammy point. noms. Tis the <laughs> season, Tay. A lot going on. Eventually, we can get there. I hope we can get Wicked there. That's the whole point. Tour? Yeah, come on. Everybody's out there. I got a grande's having a great time. Uh, we do want to talk football. He is the pop star in my life. He, of course, is Drake May. He is the quarterback of the New England Patriots. Coming off a win, he went to his press conference. He said, "Let's get a clap for the defense." Not sure he understands how the media works. They are not pulling for the team, but I do appreciate <laughs> the move by Drake May. Uh, your thoughts? Just the future quarterback of the Patriots. It seems like all things are moving in the right direction, right? Yeah, I mean, my thoughts were like, I was putting myself in that room because, you know, I've I've, I've been in versions of that room a lot of times. And it must be so, like, you want to... You don't want to be like antagonistic to the guy, right? So you're mm-hmm. like, oh, uh, I don't want to leave you hanging. I don't want to make <laughs> right. this an awkward moment. But also, like, I'm a reporter. I'm not going to sit here clapping for the defense. I thought that was really funny. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it's just been far from a perfect season in New England, obviously. But I think they just have to be so happy with with what they've seen from Drake May. And I think, like, the thing that sticks out to me is... You know, I think Mayo has had an up and down season. Like we've talked about it and hasn't all been perfect, but I think now you're starting to see that like the team is still really playing hard Mm -hmm. and they're playing hard for the, like, I think that's a reflection on the coach, but I also think it, some of that comes from the fact that there's just like an organization gets hope when they have a young quarterback and a good one. Um, So it's, it's starting to seem, you know, record aside, like, things are brighter in New England than they've been the past few years, for sure. It is fun to watch Drake may have some fun with this team. I want to talk about Mike Tomlin, because anybody you put under center, it feels like they end up winning games. He's been over 500 throughout his entire career, and there begs the question, Nora, is Mike Tomlin underrated at this point? I mean, he is an elite coach. We know he is one of those guys that's going to be in the conversation every year for the coach of the year. But it does feel like we're almost taking it a bit for granted right now as we watch the Steelers look like a team who could, uh, you know, potentially make a dark horse run to the Super Bowl. I mean, I don't think Mike Tomlin is underrated by me. Okay, I rate good. him very highly. <laughs> I think in general, like, there's a, it's, there's a funny thing with Tomlin where the national media rates him, I think, properly – by mm-hmm. which I mean very highly. And then my sense is that if you go to Pittsburgh every year, it's like, oh, they got to fire Tomlin. It's, this has gone on too long. Got to get Tomlin out of there. And so maybe that's what what will change based on this season. Um, I think he's one of the best coaches in the NFL. The only current coaches who have a higher win percentage. Uh, I looked this up for you, Tate. It's like Jim it. Harbaugh. Yeah, um, <laughs> my guy. <laughs> Based on NFL results alone, yeah, although, yeah, yeah. You, know, you right. could throw college in there. But Jim Harbaugh, Matt Lafleur, Nick, Nick Sirianni, then you've got Andy Reid and Sean McDermott. 
of those mm. guys, I mean, Matt LaFleur, I don't think quite has the track record. He hasn't been coaching anywhere near as long, obviously. Um, and he doesn't have the Super Bowl. Uh, he's the only name other than like Andy Reid, obviously, that I would sort of flirt with, with like, if I were starting a team tomorrow, who would I rather have coaching? You know, Reid is one of the greats. I think Belichick and Andy Reid are, are the two names from this era where Tomlin's a great coach, but I think most people would say that those guys have have done more for the game and accomplished more. But on that list, like I, I'm not taking Sean McDermott over mm-hmm. Mike Tomlin. I'm certainly not taking Nick Sirianni over Mike Tomlin. <laughs> um, Harbaugh's a funny case. Uh, he's certainly not been as much of like a steady Eddie as Mike Tomlin. So, uh, you know, I rate him as one of the best coaches in the NFL. Yeah, so I don't I- think I underrate him. Yeah, I think that's a fair rating. Uh, consistency matters. Uh, and one of the most consistent teams in football, of course, the Kansas City Chiefs. Will they ever lose a football game again? Uh, I think it's the larger question here, Nora. They get away with another one. The Broncos look primed to have a field goal to win that game. And then all of a sudden it was gone. And in heartbeat, uh, how do you feel about the Chiefs? And like, when do you see this kind of, I don't even want to call it luck. I don't know, this this ride ending. Or is there an end to this ride other than the Super Bowl? Well, no, it is. I mean, it. It is luck, like, if, and by mm. which I mean the Chiefs winning games playing the way they're playing, where they're winning games based on these really high variance um, individual plays, individual moments, plus winning games based on the fact that their offense is not a good offense on first and second down, but a very good best in the league by EPA offense on third downs. That is a recipe for regression. A team that plays like that, if they can and succeeds playing like that, if they continue playing like that, their results will get worse. Mm -hmm. I think the reason this is a complicated conversation with the Chiefs is I'm not sure it's a given that they're going to keep playing like this. If they do, if the Chiefs go into the Super Bowl and they are still like, it's like the 16th or 18th best team by EPA on first and second downs and the best on third downs, I will not pick them to win the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. I like it. But I don't think it's a guarantee that they're not going to get better. Like this, Mm. this is where I think there's a little bit of room in the in in how we analyze them, right? Because like if they continue to play like this, no, I don't I, I think they will lose at least one game. And I don't think that they will be a Super Bowl team. But I also don't think that it's a given that they're going to keep playing like this because I still think that, you know, receiver core is iffy and Mahomes is maybe too eager to take some of the underneath stuff than to try to go for some explosives. They have things to figure out in the run game. That said, I I'm just not ready to count on Reed and Mahomes to not figure things out and to not get better. So I think they will be a better team by the time the playoffs roll around. And given the fact that they haven't lost a game, they have a lot of margin for error now to play with as they try to figure that stuff out. Yeah, and they are the best duo that we have in the game right now, and they are trying to go for a three-peat. So uh, I would bet on them figuring something out. One last thing before we go to break here, Nora. Aaron Rodgers preached patience, talked about this team this year. They got to buy in every day. The season's not over with. They're not mathematically eliminated at this point. Is the Aaron Rodgers experiment in New York officially on the way to being on the outs? Or, like, is there a chance for some sort of redemption? Like, where do we stand in, in the arc the of Aaron Rodgers? Yeah, it's I don't gotta know. It's got to be on the outs, Tate. It's Mathematically, the we're not on the outs. That's what he's saying. He said it's not I mean, over. If that's in terms of if he's going to stick around next season, I, I really don't know. Um, mm. Without him, it would be, uh, well, either way, um, $49 million against their cap that would be a dead cap hit if if he ended up leaving or retiring um i did read a report in yahoo sports from charles robinson uh that said that as part of the adams trade rogers had kind of committed to sticking around for next year to me that would feel like a surprise i just i i think it's you know he is not the player that he once was the team is really struggling i think you can see that this era of Jets football that was so built around Rodgers. I just think they play like a team of mercenaries. They don't play like a team that cares about each other. And I just don't know how you come back from that when everything is still designed to be 
you know, to have the quarterback be such a focal point. Um, so to me, it looks pretty, pretty over and pretty tough. But, you know, I am interested in the fact that a, a great NFL reporter like Charles Robinson is saying that as part of making that trade, um, Rogers at least strongly intimated that that he was going to stick around. So I guess we have to see. Yeah, lip service. Uh, did he sign something? You know, there's going to be a lot of questions, but I do know this. The Vikings are one quarterback away, and Brett Favre has already paved this path before, so maybe there's a chance oh my that gosh. he makes the move. On that note, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk to Nora more about the NFL. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Through the Ringer. We're here with Noah Princiati, and we are trying to make sense of what's happening in the NFL. There is a lot happening, and I do want to talk about the Dallas Cowboys. Now, they are not having a great season, which uh, for a lot of people out there, they say, praise be. That means we don't have to talk about this team, but it is America's team, so therefore, we always have to talk about them. Even if they're bad or if they're good, it doesn't matter. They're in the conversation, and Jerry Jones is always in the conversation. Uh, Dak Prescott is out for the year, reported by Jerry Jones. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this before, uh, but the, the state of the Cowboys, Nora, like from the outside looking in, where are we and how much of this circus will continue the rest of the season? I mean, I, I wonder if actually sort of counterintuitively the circus has has really come to town and maybe is now on its way out because now that Dak Prescott is, is done, mm -hmm. I think most people will internalize that this team is hopeless as right. opposed to running out this real dog and pony show every week where it's like, how are the Cowboys going to manage to, to underwhelm people's expectations of them? <laughs> this whole thing with Jerry and the curtains is just like, I mean, it is just the most Cowboys thing that's ever happened. Exactly. Where, you know, you got a receiver who drops what would have been a touchdown pass <laughs> because he's blinded by the sun. This is an issue all the time at AT&T. I do think this gets lost in how people talk about this a little bit. They have curtains on the stadium. Like they have blackout curtains. Jerry's saying, well, what are you going to do? Like tear down the stadium? No, obviously you don't need to do that. You also don't even need to <laughs> install drastic. curtains. Yes. They're there. They exist. You have them for other events, but he just doesn't want to use them because they like the visual of, you know, and it's, it's beautiful. Like the mm -hmm. light streaming in through the glass windows. <laughs> But it's screwing your team up, man. And then I just think the most Jerry Jones moment of all time is he's giving that press conference and the random where's the moon at mm. the end of it was like the funniest. I just I, I can't even be mad about it. Like it was no. just so funny. Right. And talking about like the schedule, like we get a sun schedule every single year. Like we're going to know where the sun is. <laughs> like, is he talking about the farmer's almanac? Yes. Is that we all what it is? I think it is. It's kind of like the title chart that you get at the beach or something. Like yeah. when it's high tide no, and that's, tide. that's what I thought. I was like, I think he's talking about the almanac. <laughs> A hundred percent. Very old school and also very Jerry Jones. Also, when they built the stadium, I remember them bragging about the sun being like an advantage to them against certain teams. Like they're like, we're going to blind our opponents uh, when they have to deal with the sun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's a crazy thing, but it does lend itself to the larger conversations. I don't of, think like, Jerry factored <laughs> in that sometimes you lose the coin toss. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Right. The whole thing is just an absolute mess. Uh, I joked about blowing up the Death Star earlier in the year as like a way to fix the bad juju in there. And I feel like Jerry might be actually tinkering with the idea. I want to talk about the 49ers. They've had a nightmare start to the year. Things seem to be turning the corner, though. They get McCaffrey back. Debo Samuel almost got in a little bit of a scuffle on the sidelines with his long snapper and his kicker. Then the kicker wins the game for him. So I guess everything's all good there. But have we turned a corner for the 49ers? Do we feel like they're moving back towards who they were a season ago i think they are moving in the right direction mm -hmm. um i do think that you know i would like to see that offense obviously having christian mccaffrey um in there makes a huge difference for them but i, I would like to see them over a slightly longer stretch of time see if they could move away from how much they'd been relying on on purdy to be the kind of, you know, drop back passer in a pass heavy offense, throwing deep down the field, which has not historically been their bread and butter when they've been at their best as an offense, but had been something that I think they were over relying on this season. 
even in ways that sort of outpace the fact that they were missing guys due to injuries. So I, I would like to see them string a few good games together, a few good offensive games together, and try to take a little bit off of the quarterback. And mm -hmm. then I would start to feel pretty good. But absolutely arrow pointing up there. Yeah, I like McCaffrey being back. Just the visual of him being out there. I don't feel like he looks like the McCaffrey that we saw a year ago. Obviously, the most outstanding player in the league. But I do think that, uh, you know, just having him out there, the threat of him is almost enough to get the 49ers back into the right gear with this team, this offense especially. Last thing, Nora, before we let you go, you are in New York City, so you know what's going on with the Giants. There's a lot of conversations about their future. Uh, is Daniel Jones a part of the future is the bigger question. And is Bill Belichick maybe even the biggest question? Is Bill Belichick losing? looming in the background waiting to come in and swoop in for that job so i it is pretty clear to me that daniel jones this is the easy one mm -hmm. daniel jones is i think it's i think it's over um, yeah, it's we may in fact even look back on that on that game in germany as kind of what sealed it mm -hmm. um to me we will know for sure if and when but i think it's a when and not an if they bench him in order to avoid potentially triggering um, those injury guarantees. And you've already seen Brian Dable answer some questions this week from Giants media members about who their their starter is going to be going forward. That sound a little bit like the classic, you know, Daniel is our starter right now, or <laughs> right. I'm not going to commit to that. Like, <laughs> it, it is the easiest thing in the world for a coach to just say, Yes, we're committed to this guy, even mm. if it's a lie, honestly, or if you haven't made a decision yet. The second they start equivocating, I'm just like, OK, it's done. He's yeah. it's it's happening. Um, and then I think, you know, then then the the question to me is just going to be, is this an offseason in which they just look for a new quarterback or is this a full scale cleaning of house? Um, mm. I think. Dable is not the hottest, not on the hottest seat in the league, but it's definitely warm. And I, I think Joe Shane's job will probably get some scrutiny. Um, so, you know, if, if you're Dable and they're moving on from the quarterback potentially, and, and also possibly looking at a pretty high draft pick, you were not part of the regime that drafted Daniel Jones. You probably would really, really love to stick around to be able to choose your next quarterback. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. I don't, I don't know that that's set in stone one way or another. Um, yeah, but I, yeah, I, think, I think that's the pitch of your day ball though. You're like, I didn't never had my guy here. I need to get my guy in and then I can become, you know, the, the best version no, I, of myself I, that's with the Giants. Definitely the argument that he would want to make. Mm -hmm. Um, and does the Belichick factor sort of swing it a little bit in one direction? Maybe like I, it's, it's possible. And with that organization in particular, they could be one of the ones where the fact that he's out there seems tempting. Yeah, it does feel like John Mara needs something to help him sleep. Uh, obviously, watching Saquon this year has kept him up at night. So maybe uh, the, the idea of Belichick could get him there. Uh, Nora, you're the best. Thanks so much for coming to the show. Where can we find all your amazing work? And then we'll let you go enjoy the rest of your day. Ringer.com, Ringer NFL show, every single album podcast feed. It's the best. Nora, you're the best. Thanks so much for coming on the show, and we will see you soon. Thanks again. Thanks, Tate. have it for another edition of through the ringer thanks again to cousin sal as always coming on the show boy do we have a good time and also thanks to nora princiati as well go check out all of her work on the ringer.com we appreciate you tuning in and we will see you next week here on through the ringer